There are movies that are produced and released and sent into you know, broad publication for people to go and buy tickets to, and they become somewhat of instant classics. And sometimes you watch some of those movies and you're like, wow, that was really good. Other times you watch those movies that the critics rave about and you think to yourself, why did I waste my time with that, right? Now, sometimes there's, there's adequate warnings, like people tell you, don't go see Napoleon Dynamite. Listen to them, please. <laughs> Please listen to them, right? Dumb, dumb movie. People say Nacho Libre is really stupid. Don't waste your time with that. Don't listen to them. Nacho Libre is wonderful, right? No, I'm, I'm... One movie that was released to really critical acclaim, and it did well at the box office, received well by audiences around the nation, was released in 1993. It's a movie called Groundhog Day. Again, I don't understand. I think it's a dumb movie. I, I, don't, I don't like it. I don't enjoy it. I've seen it um, bits and pieces here and there. But if you're not familiar at all with the story, and I know for some of you, 1993 was before you were ever conceived, right? And so you, you're like, wow, you're talking about like old pictures. Did they have sound back then? Um, 1993, if you're not familiar with the story, Phil Connors is an insufferable meteorologist who gets stuck in Poxitani, Pennsylvania when he goes to cover Groundhog Day to see whether or not the groundhog would see his shadow, and he gets stuck in this time loop there where he lives the same day over and over again, and for a time, his transgressions in the movie become Worse and worse and worse. Why? Because he quickly discovers that there's really no consequences for anything that he does. And so at one point, you see him figuring out the best way to rob a, a, a truck carrying money to the bank. And other times, he does all kinds of other crazy things. And, and his transgressions get worse and worse. Why? Because there's no real consequence to what he does. Now, believe it or not, and some of you will find this hard to believe, there are actually people who have studied the movie Groundhog Day. I can't tell you why, all right? There's, there's no reason on earth why anybody should study that movie other than people have way too much time on their hands. But they've studied the movie, and they determined that the main character, Phil Connors, lived the same day 12,400 times. There's actually an entire article online that you can read, and someone walks you through how they came up with that. Say, why did you waste your time reading that? I have no idea, but I did. <laughs> Turn to the book of Judges, please, chapter number two. Judges chapter number two. You know, sometimes reading the book of Judges can feel to us a little bit like watching Groundhog Day. Why? Because of the repeating nature of the cycles that are recorded for us in this unusual book. Yet there is an amazing message in Judges that really does cause us to notice and proclaim who is a God like you. And I hope today to show you at least the beginning of that message. Look with me in Judges chapter number 2, beginning in verse number 16. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them, meaning Israel, out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. That's an important verse. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he said, Because this people have transgressed my covenant that I have commanded their fathers and have not obeyed my voice, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that... Joshua left when he died in order to test Israel by them, whether they will take care to walk in the way of the Lord as their fathers did or not. So the Lord left those nations, not driving them out quickly, and he did not give them into the hand of Joshua. Father, I ask you as we look to the Bible this morning, Lord, that you would teach us, that you would give us understanding, understanding, 
Father, that you would graciously allow us to apply by the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit the truths contained in this passage to our lives, that we might be conformed to the image of your Son and thereby glorify you. Be our teacher today, for we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. You know, human sinfulness magnifies God's grace. As we look at the passage that we have read and will consider this morning, that is a message or the message that I think sticks out most prominently. We see God's grace in verse number 16 stand out right from the beginning. It's almost as if God is is allowing us in the middle of what is a very dark book, in the middle of what is a very dark passage of Scripture detailing the sin of the Israelites, it's almost as if God shines the spotlight for us on His grace. and, And He says, listen, pay attention. Here is my grace. Don't miss my grace. In the midst of human sin... Sin that is running rampant. Listen, you cannot read or study the book of Judges and miss the profoundness of human sin. These pages are essentially a catalog of sins, not just the sins of ordinary Israelites going about their days in the land. No, no, no. If you study this book, you'll quickly see and understand that it's also a catalog of the sins of the very people that God raised up to deliver Israel from their oppressors. It's a catalog of the sins of the leadership that God brought out so that these people might uh, escape from the oppression and the, and the misery of that oppression. And we see the sin of the leaders waxing worse and worse as the book goes through. We will talk next week about the very first judge, Othniel, and man, what a righteous and good judge. But then we get to Samson, and Samson is a train wreck, morally speaking. And so we see a progression in this book of Sin, a catalog of sin. Sin looms large in Judges. One of the reasons why God's people struggled so greatly with sin was because simply they had no regard for Yahweh. If you look up in verse number 10, we talked about this a little bit last week. And all the, that generation who were gathered to their fathers, the generation of Joshua and the generation after, there rose another generation after them who did not know the Lord. And last week we pointed out that a lot of times this phrase is taken to mean that this generation did not teach the next generation about Yahweh. They did not, they did not teach them about God. They did not teach them what God had done in delivering them from slavery in Egypt. They did not teach them uh, who God was, his attributes, or really the, the requirements of the covenant that God had made with the nation. And that's not necessarily what this means. What it really implies is this. While the generation, uh, before the generation given to us in Judges, may have done well in communicating to their children about God and about the covenant and about all that God had done, that generation made a volitional choice. They exercised their will to say, you know what? doesn't matter to me. I I don't care what Yahweh has done for us. I I don't care what Yahweh demands of us. It doesn't have any bearing on my life whatsoever. It, It has no influence in how I'm going to live my life. I'm going to do it in the words of Frank Sinatra, my way. I'm going to live for my purpose. I'm going to live for my glory. I'm going to live for my good. I'm going to do the things I want to do when I want to do them, the way I want to do them. I'm going to worship who I want to worship. I'm going to serve who I want to serve. And I'm not going to consider Yahweh at all. That's what it means. And so they had no regard for Yahweh, therefore they, the Bible says, abandoned him. Because they didn't regard him, they didn't see a need for him, and so they simply turned from him to these other gods. One author put it this way, amnesia produces apostasy. Because they would not regard the Lord, they turned from him. And so as we consider really the message of Judges, as we consider the message of this passage, 
then we often then need to see how human sinfulness affects us, but we also need to see human sinfulness, the depths of human depravity, to really understand in a clear way how gracious God is. Human sin magnifies God's grace. But ask yourself this question. How often do I take God's grace for granted? You know, God displays his grace to us daily in in countless ways. The entire human race lives under the umbrella of what we call God's common grace. When the sun is shining and warming the air, it warms the air not just for the righteous, but for the unrighteous, not just for believers, but for unbelievers. God, the Bible says, causes it to rain on the just and the unjust, and so both the just and the just receive the benefit of the rain and how it causes the crops to grow, leads to harvest, so that both the righteous and the unrighteous, the saved and the unsaved, are able to eat, be satiated. There's common grace all around us. If it were not for God's common grace, what in the world would this world look like? What in the world would this culture resemble? But then there is a grace, there is a a special grace, there is a saving grace that that believers receive, and and we've experienced a saving grace, and in, in saving grace, we come to understand that our sins are forgiven, that our relationship with our Creator is restored, that our future is secure, and it's all because of God's overwhelming, God's matchless saving grace. And yet we still take that grace for granted. Think about that for a moment. And you will never understand the magnitude of God's grace that you have received in salvation until you know the depth of your own sinfulness. This was part of the Apostle Paul's desire as he wrote the book of Romans. He wanted his readers to see the hopeless condition of man so that they could understand then the need for salvation and turn to Christ alone and in trusting Jesus, what happens? They receive that saving grace and at the same time, Paul did not want these people who had received the saving grace of God to believe that because they've received this grace that they could sin freely and frequently and and, and therefore magnify God's grace. Why? Because in Romans chapter 5, he writes what? Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. But then in Romans chapter 6, he says, don't get the wrong idea. Those of you who lean towards an antinomian understanding, no, no, no. Uh, You're not set free from sin, and you have not been given the grace of God which uh, covers and erases your sin and, and makes you right before God. You have not received the imputed righteousness of Christ so that you can go out and live in sin. He says, God forbid that we who are dead to sin should live any longer in therein. And, and that God forbid is the strongest possible negation in the, in the Greek language. It's like, no, you cannot live this way. And so while human sin magnifies God's grace, that is not an excuse for us then to live sinfully. Human sin does magnify God's grace, and we should not sin to magnify God's grace to a greater degree. God's grace does not motivate us to sin. It motivates us truly not to sin. And so this morning, I pray that that you leave here with a greater understanding of your sinfulness. And I pray that you leave here with a constant desire in your heart not to sin, but more importantly, I pray you'll understand and appreciate God's grace so that you will not disregard God and turn from him. That you will praise God for his grace that is greater than all of your sin. That that you would not take for granted God's grace. But that leads to a question. How does this text here in Judges chapter 2, an Old Testament text, how does this text show us that human sin magnifies God's grace? Well, the text actually answers that question in three distinct movements, each leading to the next. Let me show you first the persistence of sinners. Sinners. 
verses 17 and 19, we have Israel's sinfulness on display. Israel's sinfulness was actually established very early by the author of Judges. In chapter number one, we see that Israel disobeyed God and they did not fully drive out the inhabitants of the land, which was an act of rebellion and defiance of God's clearly stated commands. Then we come to the beginning of chapter two where the angel of the Lord comes and he calls out Israel for their sinfulness and the people of Israel then wept, but notice they did not repent. It doesn't say that they were so overcome with grief because of their sinfulness that they they wept in repentance before the, the Lord. No, it just simply says they wept. There's no acknowledgement here by the children of Israel of their sinfulness. The text leads us to believe that the reason they wept is because God then pronounced judgment on them. I will not drive out the inhabitants before you, but they will oppress you. They will become thorns in your sides and their gods will be a snare to you. And so the weeping was most likely in response to God saying, listen, your time in the land because of what you've done is going to be very, very hard. You're gonna pay the price. Now we come into this text and we see more detail about their sinful actions. And I know that in today's culture and in the, the, the modern church, it's not copacetic and I know it's not cool to talk about sin. We talk about mistakes and we talk about brokenness and we talk about all this stuff. We use every word possible except sin. But listen, sometimes you just got to call it what it is. It's sin. And we can't ignore it. These people sinned against God. And we see here the the persistence of their sin. The word persistence means to go on resolutely or stubbornly despite opposition. And what's crazy here is the, the, the thing, the one who was opposing them in their sin was God. God was saying, no, you can't live this way. I've already prescribed for you how you are to live in the land. I've already set clearly before you the way that you're supposed to live. And you cannot live this way. You're disobeying me. And what are they doing in this text? They're actually persisting against God. What brazenness. What arrogance comes from disregarding God. From from neglecting God what God has done from, from turning aside from him. Persistent mean, persistence means to go on resolutely. And, and we see that at the beginning of verse number 17. Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. Look at that language. They whored after other gods. What does it mean? It means that they were unfaithful to Yahweh. I want to put it delicately. They were unfaithful to Yahweh. They were involved in a covenant relationship. But that covenant meant nothing to them. And so they gave their affection. And they gave their attention. And they gave themselves over to these other gods. They worshipped them. Even though God had established, you'll have no other God before me. You're not going to worship any other God. You're not going to create any idol and and bow yourself down to it. None of that mattered. It's, It's what they did. And they continued in it. Verse number 19 Look what it says. But whenever the judge died, they turned back. It's the second time we've seen this idea of turning aside or turning back. The first is up in 17. Second is in verse number 19. And notice what it says. They were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them and bowing down to them. And we'll find out later that they actually sacrificed to them. And they did not drop. They did not cease and desist. Any of their wicked practices is really what it's saying, or their stubborn ways. See, whenever the judge died that God had raised up, they turned back and they were more corrupt than their fathers. They had a tenaciousness 
in their unwillingness to yield to what God has said. They turned aside from the way of their fathers. The the word turned aside there is is interesting. I I tried to think of a way to um, explain it, and the thing that kind of kept coming back to my mind actually comes from a show some of you may be familiar with called The Mandalorian. Right? Some of you know the show. So The Mandalorian uh, is really about this guy who has given himself to a certain way of life. There's a certain manner of living that the Mandalorian or the Mandalorian way imposes upon all who would be Mandalorians. And so whenever a Mandalorian is given instructions, the one who gives instructions says what? This is the way. And the one who receives the instruction says, this is the way. What is going on there, right? It's, okay, there is a, there is a way for you to live if you're going to be this. And the one who is giving the instruction acknowledges that that is the way that is appropriate for one who will be a Mandalorian. And the one who is receiving the instruction is saying, I confirm and I agree, but this is the way that I should live. This is the way that I should conduct myself. This is the way that I should comport myself as one who desires to be a Mandalorian. Obviously, the children of Israel were not Mandalorians. That would be interesting, but they're not. But they're the people of God, and as the people of God, during Moses' life and ministry, these children of Israel were given the way. And the generation highlighted in this text, they saw their fathers obey the commandments of the Lord. Not perfectly, but they saw right before them the example of their fathers obeying the commandments of the Lord. But this generation here in Judges, they're indicted in this text for doing what? For turning away from the way, from turning aside. They, they changed their orientation or their direction. They, they knew, okay, as children of God living in the land, this is the way that we're supposed to go. But this is not the way that we want to go. Yes, our fathers went this way. They showed us the way, but it doesn't mean anything to us because, again, what matters to us is what we want. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go the opposite direction. We're going to turn and, and go the way that we are not supposed to go. And they did this even knowing the foolishness of their actions. They did this knowing what their actions would cost them. And what doesn't make any sense to me is the fact that God had been so very good to his people. God had fulfilled every promise that he had made. And even if they didn't see the need to worship God, Yahweh, exclusively because of who he is, they should have at least worshipped him and been faithful to him because of what he had done for them, which is actually Paul's argument in Romans 6. After saying that where sin abounds, grace much more abounds, we go into we should not give ourselves to sin. And then Paul, instead of plunging us more deeply into the law and saying, okay, here's the list of do's and don'ts that that are prescribed for you, what Paul does then is he actually plunges us even deeper into the gospel. He plunges us even deeper into grace so that we might know because God has saved us through Christ. Our lives should reflect his purpose. And that we should mortify the flesh. And we should not give our members over to sinful living and activity. So it doesn't make sense that the children of Israel would do this. But in this we see the strong power and pull of sin on the human condition. And we know about that, don't we? We know and understand, even as people who have been saved and made new creations in Christ Jesus, we know and understand the the power and the pull of sin. The indwelling sin that exists in our flesh is ignited by and attracted to the, the, the allure of the world and the world system around us. 
And what we have to realize is this, that as God's people who have been redeemed, that we have been set free from the shackles of sin, that we are no longer slaves to sin, that sin no longer has authority over us. All that to say this, that if we persist in sin, I'm not saying that we live perfectly because we're not going to live perfectly in this life. But if we persist, meaning this, that we continually choose sin over righteousness day in and day out, moment by moment by moment, we're doing it not because we have to, but because we want to. Now, that doesn't, you know, hit us in the feels, right? That, that's, that, that bothers us because we want to sit there and say, no, 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 I sin because I have to. But that's not true, especially for those who are in Christ. Oh, I cannot wait to, to bring you guys to Romans later on this year. Because we're going to see some things in Romans, and it's going to be fun. When we get to chapter 6, and we get to, into the first part of chapter 7, we'll see some things about this. But understand this, that if you're persisting in sin, you're not doing it because it has authority over you. So the text shows us the persistence of sinners, which then moves us to observe the consequence of sin. Verses 20 through 21 and 23, we see that God here warned the Israelites against persistent sinfulness. I'm not going to take you there right now, but if you were to go to Deuteronomy chapter 28, and I, I would encourage you strongly this week to write down Deuteronomy 28 and read and really think about Deuteronomy 28 in light of what we are seeing right here. Because in Deuteronomy 28, God just lays it out as clear as possible for the, for the children of Israel so that none of them could plead ignorance. It's right there. He tells them what, they're, what he will do for them so long as they walk in the way that he has prescribed for them. But he also tells them what will happen to them if they turn from that way to the right hand or to the left. He, he just lays it out as clear as a bell. And so God had warned the Israelites against persistent sinfulness and the result of their sinfulness was oppression and persecution from other nations that would plunder them. The, the word plunder means to, to be raided. It's the idea of, of, a, of a raider or a pirate who would come and, and, and take the spoil from them. But why were they going to deal with this? Why were they going to deal with this kind of oppression? Well, simple, because the Bible says the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. In verse number 20, the author here used powerful language by telling us that they transgressed. The word transgression has the idea of, of understanding that there is a clear line, if you'll let me put it this way, in the sand. And in seeing that line, it is communicated, do not cross that line. And the person who transgresses knows that they must not cross that line. They see the line clearly, and it doesn't matter to them. They step over it, and they do so not because they were shoved over it, but because they want to cross it. They transgressed. They did the things that they were not supposed to do. What's an example of those things? Well, we see here that they... Again, they hoard themselves after other gods. They bowed down to them. They turned aside. They worshiped them. They did not drop these practices or their stubborn ways. Turn over to chapter 3. We'll see another thing that they did. Verse number 6. Not only did they not drive out the inhabitants of the land, but their daughters they took to themselves for wives. In other words, they, they took daughters of these pagan nations. For wives, they were told explicitly, do not intermarry. Their own daughters they gave to their sons. So the Israelites were giving their daughters to these pagan men. 
and they served their gods. Verse 7, the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They transgressed. They did not obey God's voice. And the Bible says that God was angry. Why was he angry? Was he just pitching a fit? Was he having a temper tantrum because he didn't get his way? I told you what to do, you didn't do it, and so I'm, I'm mad, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you that I'm mad, and no, that's not it. He was angry because, actually, in Exodus 20, he describes himself, not just there, but other times in the Pentateuch, as a jealous God. I am, he says, a jealous God. This is why he's angry. You might be thinking, well, isn't jealousy a sin? Isn't anger a sin? Let me ask you this question. What would you think if you learned of a man who discovered that his wife of any length of time at all was having an affair with another man? And this man was a loving husband, a faithful husband, a kind husband, a devoted husband. He was doing all he could to love his wife as Christ loved the church. And none of that mattered to his wife. His wife completely ignored, disregarded the the vow that she made completely disregarded the covenant that they made together, and she gave herself to another man. And upon hearing that news, the the, the faithful husband, the good husband, simply says, "Mm, you win some, you lose some. Them's the breaks sometimes. What would you think of that man? Would you question whether or not he truly loved his wife? Of course you would. Why? Because in getting that news, the response of a sane person isn't, "Ah." it's not this nonchalant reaction of I don't care. No, a man who loves his wife is going to be what? Righteously jealous. Why? Why? Because he obligated himself to her and she obligated herself to him and she broke that obligation. She broke that claim that he had on her. One commentator said, jealousy is love burst into its proper flame. God was jealous and angry here because he loved his people. One author said, to have a God who loves his people is to have a jealous God, and to have a jealous God is to have an intolerant God. Love divine is an absolute claim. So God was right to be angry. But we also see then sin carries a price. In the New Testament, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. The reality is this, that God created you to love him, to serve him, to worship him, to be loved by him. But every human being is born in sin. And as such, we are separated from the loving goodness and saving grace of God. And and please listen to this. If you never turn to Jesus alone for salvation, if you never turn to Jesus alone for forgiveness, then, then you will one day most definitely receive the wages of your sin for eternity. You will die and forever be under the wrath of Almighty, Holy God, your Creator. But those who trust Jesus are forgiven. They are pardoned. And they will live forever with their Creator. Why? Because His Son paid the price for their sin. See, sin always carries a price. There's always a consequence to sin. Either you will pay the price of your sin or you will trust in the one who has paid that price for you and live for the glory of God alone. So we've seen the movement 
from the sinner's persistence to sin's consequence in the text, which then moves us to behold finally the grace of God. Listen, the grace of God is as unmistakable in this text as the sin of man is. Both scream out to us. Both declare themselves to the reader. Verse number 16 is filled with grace. It's the first verse that we read. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. What a grace-filled verse. These people who persisted in sin, these people who had no regard for Yahweh, these people who knowingly transgressed and broke their covenant with God and were unfaithful to God and served other gods. Yes, they experienced the the consequences of their sin, but here in this text, God comes up and says, you know what, I'm going to show grace to you. You don't deserve it. But that's the thing about grace, isn't it? It's never deserved. It can never be earned. It is never merited. It is given freely. If you take the first lines of verses 14 and 16, and then you you look at verse number 18, and, and you scrunch those together, you see an amazing picture play out right before you. Let me let me show you. The anger of the Lord was kindled against them, meaning the sinful Israelites. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them. He saved them from the hand of their enemies. Wow. These people were unfaithful to God. Why in the world would he save them? Why not just wipe them off the face of the earth? It's what they deserved. But as always, the answer is found for us in the text. Notice with me, verse number 18. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge. He saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. Here's the explanation. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted And oppress them. God showed grace not because they deserved it, but because He is compassionate and He's merciful. We see that in the phrase that He was moved to pity by their groaning. The the word groaning is actually only used three times in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Old Testament. It's found the first time in Exodus 2. It's found again, I think it's in Exodus 6, and then it's found again here in Judges chapter 2. And the idea is this. To be so miserable in your condition that you can't really express it in words. Some of you know, when I was a child, I had spinal meningitis. Um, Had it pretty bad, almost died. The Lord was gracious to me and brought me back to health. And I was in the hospital for two weeks. And uh, in the hospital, of course, they were always pushing IVs, different fluids and medications into my body to drive out the infection. And... uh, one of the, the IVs had been in my arm for a considerable amount of time, and uh, this nurse, who I affectionately refer to as Nurse Ratchet, came into my room one night and said, hey, uh, Matt, that 
IV's been in your arm for, for a long time. I need to take out that needle and, and put in a new line and a new, new needle as I uh, push this medication in your arm. Well, I was nine years old. What was I going to say? Get away from me. Um, no. So I, I laid there and took it. And I, I hate needles. I don't like being stuck by anything. As a nine-year-old, I hated it. As a 49-year-old, I hate it. I go to the doctor now, and they draw blood, and I'm like, mm. you know, I just, if I don't see it, it's not actually happening kind of thing. And, uh, and so this nurse came in, and, uh, and she took the, the, the one line out, and she put a, a new line in, and um, she left. And the night went on, and throughout the night, I had this overwhelming pain in my arm. It was so bad that I remember just laying there through the night, not having the words to describe or express what was happening, and I just moaned all night. I groaned all night long. See, what happened is the nurse missed the vein, and so she put it right into my arm, and so my all of that medication was filling up my tissue so that my arm the next morning looked like Popeye's forearms. I mean, I was, you know, had this massive forearm over here and, and your arm's not supposed to do that. And so it hurt really bad. And, and so I was just groaning all night. This is what the children of Israel were doing. They, they were groaning. But notice this. They groaned because they were miserable under oppression. Not because they were repenting of their sin. They still hadn't learned anything. So they were in this situation. And God, the Bible says was moved by pity or to pity by their groaning. This is grace. The Bible also says here that in verse number 22, he tested Israel. Now, you look at that and you say, how in the world does testing demonstrate the, the grace of God? Well, by leaving the Canaanites in the land, God showed the Israelites something very important. He taught them a very important lesson. And that is this. That they needed a righteousness that they themselves did not possess. Their law keeping was not the hope of their ultimate salvation. They needed to look to another to do for them what they could not do for themselves. See, their sin revealed their need for a Savior. In the same way, in the New Testament, Paul says what? That sin reveals to us our need for Christ. Because when we are tempted to sin and we give in to sin over and over again, then we realize that we cannot keep the law of God perfectly. And so we need to trust in one who did. And the only one who did was Jesus Christ himself. Amen. The Puritan John Newton said, but when after long experience of their own deceitful hearts, after repeated proofs of their weakness, willfulness, ingratitude, ingratitude and sensibility, they find that none of these things can separate them from the love of God in Christ. Jesus becomes more and more precious to their souls. They love much because much has been forgiven them. But he also says, in a word, some of the clearest proofs they have, they have had of his excellence have been occasioned by the mortifying proofs they have had of their own vileness. They would not have known so much of them if they had not known so much of themselves. And so we see the grace of God on display. We also see one of the wonderful attributes of God on display is the fact that he does not change. His compassion 
is not based on emotion, but on his character and nature and promise. As I said before, the Hebrew word for, for groaning is used three times. The first time it's used, Exodus chapter 2, is when the Israelites groaned in slavery in Egypt. And then the last time it's used is found here in Judges chapter 2, when they groaned under oppression. Both times God was moved by their groaning because of his covenant with them. Hundreds of years and massive acts of betrayal could not, listen to this, diminish the warmth of his compassion for his people. It's no wonder. Jeremiah says, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Newton wrote, the unchangeableness of the Lord's love and the riches of his mercy are likewise more illustrated by the multiplied pardons he bestows upon his people that then if they needed no forgiveness at all, hereby the Lord Jesus is more endeared to the soul. All boasting is effectually excluded and the glory of a full free salvation is ascribed to him alone. Oh, brothers and sisters, do you not see the grace of God on display in this text? Again, let me call your attention to Paul's writing. Now the law came so that the transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And all of this really should drive us as his people today to two conclusions. First of all, I will live this life for the glory of the one who saved me. I will live this life for the glory of the one who was moved by pity when I was in a miserable condition and could not deliver myself. I will live this life for the glory of the one who chose me, called me, saved me, and secures me. I will live this life for the glory of the one who gave me grace. The psalmist says, I I hoped earnestly for Yahweh, and he inclined to me and heard my cry for help. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, and he established my steps. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in Yahweh. Brothers and sisters, if you're in Christ, God did this for you. He has shown you mercy when you were pitiful. And he's shown you compassion, and he has saved you. And so why would you not live your life for him and his glory alone? The second conclusion is that we are in awe of such a God. Instead of disregarding him, instead of turning aside from him, instead of committing adultery against him, giving our heart and our affection to Lesser gods, gods who aren't gods at all. We stand in awe of him and we proclaim, who is a God like you who forgives iniquity and passes over the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? He does not hold fast to his anger forever because he delights in loving kindness. How can you not be in awe of a God like that? Listen, sin magnifies God's grace. And a continual awareness of God's grace keeps us from stubbornly persisting in sin. Many years ago, a song was written. And some of the lyrics go like this. Sin and despair are like a sea waves cold. Threaten the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold, points to the refuge, the mighty cross. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Listen, grace that is greater than all our sin. Listen, if sin has a hold of you, it could be that you've never received the saving grace of our glorious God. Or it could be that you have begun to take God's grace that you've received for granted. 
You disregard what God has done for you in saving you. And that gospel amnesia has caused you to turn aside. But brothers and sisters, if I just described your condition, look steadfastly at the grace of God you've received. Remember what God did for you. And that will drive you to live your life for his glory. And if you've never trusted Christ, please understand this. This is true for everybody in the room. You need Jesus. Every one of us, whether we're saved or unsaved, we need Jesus. You need the grace that Jesus can provide through his sacrifice for your sin. Human sin magnifies the grace of God. I hope you've seen that today in Judges chapter 2. Father, thank you for our time. Lord, be glorified in the response to your word. Lord, I know that there is nothing I can say, there is nothing I can do to change one heart or life. Your word is powerful, but any change truly comes from your Holy Spirit. So, Lord, if there are those here today, and I don't know the, the, the true condition of anyone sitting before me, my own heart deceives me. But Lord, if there's anyone here in this moment, there's anybody watching who has never put their faith and trust in Christ, I pray, Father, that you would help them to see beyond any doubt their need for a Savior. I pray that you would help them to see that you met that need through the life, death, burial, and resurrection of your Son. And that you alone can save those who come to Christ in faith. Lord, I pray that those who are saved would live in light of your grace. That we would not stub stubbornly persist in sin. But Lord, that we would live for your glory and purpose. So have your way in every heart and life, for I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes